Welcome, welcome everybody. Great to see you all. Just going to give a few more time, a few more minutes for people to join us. But welcome to the Global School Alliance Conference for me. All about resilience across school. It's going to be a lot of <clears throat> exciting one. I'm just going to. Few, I can see a few more people in the waiting room, so I'm going to hang on just a little few more minutes. But great to see you all and welcome. I think they're still connecting. Okay. <clears throat> Right, I think we will get on because we've got some great speakers here for you and we don't want to, to hang on much longer. So we'll let everyone in and we'll just keep going if that's okay. So please join us and, and welcome. So I can say it is May's conference about building and celebrating resilience across your school. And we have some amazing speakers for you. I'm obviously going to do my little introduction at the beginning for those of you who come often, you know that I do my little spiel and then we'll have some great speakers. We've got Paul, David and Rolla all here for you from around the world to speak to you about resilience in schools. So, but about the Global School Alliance, so who, you know, who we are, we are hosting this conference for you. Um, it's an amazing community. I think a lot of you are members, but if you're not, you should be because it's a free community to join. It is an inspirational community of fantastic sharing. Some really inspirational educators are part of our community uh, and are, are really very much active and supportive in there. The whole aim is to enable and facilitate connections between you to be able to share best practice, to learn about each other's culture, to improve the outcome of global education for students around the world. And we want to enable those connections and facilitate them. So we have programs to support you with partnerships, programs to support you with student engagement, programs to support you with trips. But the whole point is become part of our community, help connect, share with each other, and let's make an impact on the future for the students. Our vision is obviously to um, become global educators around the world. So we're looking at global education, as in creating uh, education that is, is, is for today, if you see what I mean, to prepare students to be part of a global society, because that's what they're going to be working in. That's why we're all working together. And one of the great ways to connect with everybody, we have our Facebook and our LinkedIn groups, but we have a platform. So register on the platform. You can then connect with everybody on there. There's a great news feed with where we keep you up to date with events, send messages. And um, we had a great student council this morning. So there's great information on there about that today. We, like I said, we run these monthly conferences. You'll be kept up to date with these. You'll be kept up to date with some great blogs from our, our inspirational educators. You'll, there's a, a projects to join. There are lots of opportunities to engage with each other on the platform. So please do join us and engage this way uh, and find out what we're doing. We're developing out our, our roles within it. We have a new ambassador role. It's actually replacing the ambassador pro role if, if you were here in the past. But this ambassador role is for members who want to be more active, to be able to support us in, in growing our community so that we have more and more um, great inspiration educators here to share with each other, to support each other, to grow together. So this is for a more active member, but please um, have a word with John, use this link, uh, but join us to see if you would like to be part of the ambassador program. And again, we, we love to celebrate what we're doing. So we have a, and a fantastic award scheme to celebrate all you schools out there who are developing your global dimensions. It's a great program to develop from bronze where you're raising awareness of community to silver, getting students actively participating in projects to develop skills to gold where you can you know, get back to travel, having those inspirational, life-changing experiences for students where they can travel around the world, staff travel, sharing best practice and that sort of thing. We want to support you all to become a gold accredited school and be recognized as that. Having the global dimensions embedded in your school so it's impactful and sustainable. And that is where we want to support you to, to be. And the, I say the main ways we support is looking at helping establish partnerships between schools, connecting you, embedding that international approach so it is sustainable and benefits the whole school community and is long lasting as a real legacy so that it is embedded. I've, too often, you know, a lot of these international aspects are just add-ons. We want to make sure that this is embedded in the school ethos. And again, we want to support those life-changing experiences like traveling, to visiting different schools, to have that immersive experience of peers to learn about other culture, to share your language, to learn about each other. These are our sort of three main pillars that we want to support schools with to develop your global dimensions, to improve outcomes for students around the world. It's all part of our current campaign, which is empowering school leaders to think globally. We want to provide you with opportunities to share about this, with support and programmes to help train and, and you know support you with developing this global aspect we want to be there to help you so we have various programs sorry guys can we stay muted if possible sorry. 
Um, so we have, like I said, we have programs to support you. We have currently a global whole global school transformation program uh, to support schools to develop this approach, to get it embedded, to train and accredit the school, get your staff supported, to, to provide some amazing digital experiences for students to provide amazing trips that are life-changing. We have a whole program of support that we can offer you. Uh, just obviously ask us a bit more about it. There are, we have, we run these campaigns a couple of times a year. So there is a deadline obviously towards the summer term uh, to get on the current cohort. So there's a few places left. Please ask us more about it so we can support you with, to offer these amazing experiences for your school. So get in touch for that one. Um, and like I say, to, to help leaders think globally, uh, and as part of our programs, we run leadership delegations and we're so excited that we can now start traveling around the world and these are happening again. These are commencing this uh, uh, autumn, it's October and November, where we send a leadership delegation of leaders who are either part of our school programs or wanting to know more about that country to a country um, in, in a group to do roundtables with other school leaders and educational experts in that country to learn about the country's culture, to learn about their education system, visit partner schools so there will be actually an opportunity to go and visit your partner school and other people's schools to see schools firsthand in those country uh we are running the delegation starting again um this autumn and at the moment the, the current ones are tend to be the most popular ones that members have requested be, based on language so we have uh spain france morocco tunisia mexico uh brazil china these are all happening in october the, the, we have more happening in the spring to japan taiwan um, Brazil. So there are more and more of these delegations that you can be part of. If you want to know more about how to join one or how to join one of our programs, we are running a webinar about this on, on the 13th of June. So put that in your calendar. You will also be sending out reminders to people and, and ways to register to connect with that. So looking forward to see some of you on there and travel around the world with you. I'm so excited we can actually get out there and now start visiting you all face to face, which is so much nicer than watching you through a screen. So I can say, Join our community. It is free to join us. Be kept up to date with these events like this, like the webinar on the leadership delegations. Join us for like student councils. We, like I said, we had an amazing primary council meeting this morning where the students did some great presentations about uh, um, the SDG 15, Life on Earth, how they were growing and planting things around their, their school grounds, which was wonderful. So confident at you know, such a young age, they, would, they did a great job. And, and the more the merrier, please join us and join the council because the more schools around the world, the more impact and more sharing that can go on, which is fantastic. So like I say, I talk too much. So I'm gonna shut up because we've got some great speakers, but this is basically join the Global School Alliance, be part of this uh, and, more, and get more involved. And like I say, I'm not only involved then, but today, now, be more involved with us, interact with us, say hi in the chat everyone has a chat there tell us where, where you're from say hello introduce yourself if we have with these amazing speakers if you have any questions for them you can drop that in the chat too or raise your hand we'll keep an eye on it so please interact we want to make this interactive share what you're doing um, and again like i say we we do like it to be interactive you can't hide i don't let people hide if you've been on this before and um, we have polls for you so I want to, I think Hannah's just launched this poll. We want your your opinion. We want you to interact with us. So tell us what you think resilience is and how, if your school, uh, you know, values of resilience, is it committed to developing resilience? And thank you very much for participating. So I'm going to shut up for a couple of minutes, give everyone a chance to vote. Um, it's really interesting to see your responses and to see if this is a nice thing to see around the world. Actually, always, always. Yes, it's funny, isn't it? We've got always and could do better, almost neck and neck <laughs> on the poll at the moment. But I think I think I think most people have voted now. And it's it's yeah, it's really, really 50-50, isn't it? In school, some people say yes, we, we could do better. Some people, yes, we are considering resilient students. Thank you so much for participating in that. And we will again, I think Hannah has shared the results, and we will again share this. This has been recorded and saved on the platform along with our polls and all this information. We will be sharing it with all our members and everybody who took part. So thank you for doing that and participating. And I think actually we've got another question for you. So don't relax, we've got another one. Um, <laughs> the, the other one, the next question we're interested in, Could can you be a resilient school without partnerships? Okay, without global partnerships. Oops. <laughs> okay, so another chance to vote. We've got uh, a few more minutes to give everyone a chance to answer this one too. Interesting. Okay. Some of you want to know more what resilience and being and global partnership is about, which I can understand, which is why you're here. Fantastic to see you here. 
Oh, okay. No, no is inching ahead. Those, I think, I think we have just about everyone has given us the answers. Thank you very much. And it looks like, ah, no, you can't be resilient without a global partnership. Fantastic. Thank you very much for participating in that too. Uh, and we'll get on now so we can hear more about it. Those of you who are here to learn more, we're going to get on with that. But as I did mention a minute ago, we do like to get you participating. So I'm going to give you two minutes now. I'm going to stop sharing. Two minutes now to turn your cameras on before I name and shame you. So we can practice your smile, brush your hair, just smile, turn your cameras on. I can see you there, David, without your camera on. Come on, I'm going to name and shame people without cameras on. Turn them on for two minutes. I've stopped sharing so that we can we can take some screenshots and see your wonderful faces. It's so much nicer for the speakers to see who they're talking to. So just turn your cameras on, even if it's only for a minute, so we can see your lovely faces. Fabulous. Okay. Hannah, are you taking screenshots? <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, everybody. I can I I if you really can't use your camera, I will let you off. But if you have got a camera, please turn it on and let's see you. Okay. We're going to say one, two, three, smile. <laughs> if I don't say one, two, three, smile, I end up with my mouth open and my eyes closed. So thank you everybody <laughs> for joining in. Fabulous. Okay. I'm going to go share with thank you for participating in that. Like I say, please do continue this participation in the chat. And we're going to get on now because I'm very excited to hear from our speakers. So David's going to introduce, oh, David, <laughs> sorry, John. John is going to introduce our speakers to you now. Thanks, John. Great. Thank you, Tony. Hello, everyone. A big warm welcome to our wonderful Global School Alliance community of educators. We always say in advance, you are the most important people in the world. And it is a huge thrill, a huge honour for us to work with so many amazing people. And um, we're particularly pleased to be joined by three wonderful speakers. I have told them already they're wonderful and it is so wonderful to learn from you and uh, the amazing work you're doing. So it's a big hello to Paul Browning. Uh, Paul has 27 years of teaching experience, including 15 years as a head teacher as a, at an inner city primary school. Paul is now the pupil engagement development lead at the Thrive Cooperative Learning Trust in Hull in East Yorkshire. You're very welcome, Brown. Um, Paul Browning is uh, doing amazing things. And we're staying in Yorkshire, actually, because we're moving to say hello to David Geldart. Hello, David. David is founder and chair of the Bambi Sanani Partnership between Leeds and South Africa. It's there very much to promote issues of education, sport, health, global citizenship to promote resilience in students. David has over 40 years of experience as an educator and was a member of the Sports England team that supported London's successful bid to host the 2012 Olympic and Paralympic Games. So thanks for that, David. Uh, founding member of the Sport and Sustainability Charity and a licensed football coach. David's always been a passionate advocate of the power of sport and education to change lives and recently had an audience with Pope Francis during the Rome Global Sport for All Summit. So you're very welcome, David. And it's a very warm welcome to Rolla. Hello, Rolla. Rolla Kadaj is based in Lebanon and is an education consultant and a social emotional learning trainer, a wellbeing life coach and a founder and chief executive of the Great Shining Within initiative that we'll be learning about later. Walla has a great passion and commitment to education, having had 25 years as a teacher, 21 years as an English language coordinator and a head teacher for 16 years. So we are in the hands of three amazing educators here who will be telling us about their own experiences, insights as to the importance of insights, uh, uh, resilience being at the heart of this work. So without further ado, it's over to you, Paul. Good to see you. Hello, just finding the, the mute button on, on mute. Yeah, hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is Paul Browning, and I'm going to be, first of all, getting this shared screen uh, working again. I think a bit out of practice having come out of COVID. Just bear with me one second. Right. OK, so everyone shall put onto slideshow. Oh, just as you want it to work, it stopped working. Let me just try it again.
Right. Okay. I think my system has locked me out because I've been on for, for so long today, which is a bit of a hiccup. So if you could just give me a minute or two, uh, John, and I'll, I'll get it up and running again. I'm, I'm going to have to log myself back in. We, we can if play you, it for you. We do have the master copy if you want me to go through it for you, Paul. All oh, right. No, that, that'll be, yes, that'll be good, please. Yeah, yes. Well, that'd be easy. If I share screen again, I yeah, think I'd be fine. Have, that'll save me doing that. Okay. I will get yours. I'm pretty certain we have all the master ones here. So there we go. Just tell me when to move and we'll. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. So it's, uh, I think what I haven't added on to here, which is really important, is what I'm going to talk about pupil agency uh, uh, this afternoon and the importance of that. And my passion for this stems from work I started really back in 2010. So Hull is uh, twinned with Freetown, the capital city of Sierra Leone uh, in West Africa. Uh, and the, uh, the, the partnership with that goes back uh, decades. And the history of the two uh, cities goes back centuries because Hull is the birthplace uh, and where uh, William Wilberforce uh, lived who brought about the abolition of slavery uh, acts in this country. Uh, so it goes a long way back. 2010, uh, I uh, and myself and uh, some of the head teachers went to Sierra Leone, and we've been working really closely with, uh, with our colleagues over there in Freetown since then. So much so that in 2010, a colleague and myself, uh, a colleague from Freetown and myself, set up uh, an international pupil council. So this has been going for the last 13 years now. So children in Hull uh, meet together and have meetings and uh, children uh, meet in Freetown uh, as part of this International Pupil Council. And because we're on the same timeline, it allows us to do wonderful things like have joint football tournaments going on at exactly the same time. So we'll have one in Hull and we'll have one in Freetown. So great things, as well as discuss the important things about global issues and reducing uh, pollution and all sorts of things. But in the, our initial conversations um, with my, my colleague, it quickly became apparent that while our students in Hull and England were involved in lots of little council things, school councils, we have a youth parliament in Hull and there are sort of regional uh, uh, committees that they belong to. Children in Freetown have no voice whatsoever, which is perhaps hardly surprising since they'd come out of a, a brutal civil war in 2001. So from there, I've been trying to develop a pupil voice, but it's taken a new dimension now, going from being just a mere voice to developing the sense of agency. So if you could go through to the next slide, please, Tony. Okay, and go, oh, well, we'll stop there. You, you'll be become familiar with this picture here. So some of you may have already seen this, this uh, logo, this circular logo here is the Lundy model of child participation. I should tell you who Lundy is in a minute or two and all about it. So the next slide, please. Okay, so I won't read all of this out, but I'll make this uh, PowerPoint available to you. But the focus of what I'm talking about today stems from 1989, when the United Nations had a convention of the rights of the child, a really important convention. So 54 articles were written uh, as a result of uh, this, um, and it's about how uh, adults and governments work together to make, sure, make sure children can enjoy all their rights. So obviously it's the United Nations, it's a global issue here. So next slide, please. So the one that we're particularly interested in um, is Article 12, and that's the, the rights of the, rights of the child to, to have an opinion to be listened to and taken seriously. So as you see there, it states that it's to guarantee all children capable of forming their own views, the right to express their views freely in all matters affecting them, ensures that children's views be given due weight in accordance with their age and maturity, and the opportunity to be heard uh, in judicial and administrative proceedings, either directly or indirectly. In fact, a lot of what it is, it's not just about education, but as is mentioned here, in judicial uh, meet uh, judicial uh, things as well. So if a child is unfortunate to be involved in sort of a court case, which happens, uh, domestic violence, etc., then the child the child has a right to express uh, their opinion as well. Similarly, in a health uh, uh, 
context. Uh, they have the right to say what's going on if, if they have medical treatment. It's not just their mums and dads who are saying, oh, we're going to decide to do this for the child. Obviously, as it states there, it depends on age maturity. You know, it, 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 you have to take that into, into account. Uh, next slide, please, Tony. Yeah, so, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll flick on to this one. Um, the, the previous slide would have just explained that there are uh, certain of these 54 articles which have special principle uh, status, which means they sort of connect and override, or not override, but they connect all of the others, interlock with all the, the, the other rights. Uh, yeah, it's there. So um, one thing to, to think about with uh, when children are, are giving their views and listening to them, um, it's not, as Lundy herself says, it's not a, a benefit, it's a, it's a human right to be heard. Uh, so it's not just, a, oh, it's a nice thing to do. It's really important. And if we're talking about resilience and building uh, ch uh, children's resilience, we're talking about empowering children and giving them, and, and you can only build resilience if you, you feel confident that your voice is going to be heard. So next slide, please. Uh, okay. So this lady is uh, one of the key people in this worldwide. Uh, she's a lovely lady called uh, Laura Lundy. She's professor, professor of children's rights at Queen's University, Belfast. Um, and if you, you, she's easy to connect to via LinkedIn or anything like that. If you want to have an engaging conversations with Laura, she's very receptive to any ideas. So she came up with this, uh, this diagram is her model. It's called the Lundy model after her. She actually didn't want to call it the Lundy model. Um, but interestingly enough, uh, some people said to her, look, over the centuries, all these blokes have had different things like Newton or whoever it may be, things named after them. I think you should have this named after you. So that's, but she was reluctant, but that's how it's come about. This is a sort of the final version of a few things she, she came up with. And this has been adopted by people such as the European Commission, the World Health Organization, UNICEF, UNESCO are using this. It's been increasingly used widespread around our country as well as other countries. So it's, it, this is gaining momentum. So if you're looking for a thing to jump on board, and I'm not selling anything, um, the Lundy model uh, hopefully will, will be, be something you'll be, you'll be really interested in, no matter which country you come from. The model shows this circle. If we just stop there, you, you don't have to go back, uh, uh, Tony, if you just stop there for a minute. It's divided into four areas, which we'll come to in a minute or two, space, voice, audience, and influence. Now, Belfast is in Northern Ireland, um, but the Republic of Ireland, um, which is not part of the UK, have adopted uh, Laura Lundy's model uh, as a basis for a whole participation framework uh, for, for, the, for the country. So the Irish National Participation Strategy. So if you, if, if you have this PowerPoint sent to you, you can click on these links and you can read this. The framework actually show, it tells you how uh, the Lundy model works, but it also gives loads of case studies from schools showing how the Lundy model has been used to develop pupil agency. So agency is a bit more than just having a voice. Uh, it's about having a voice that actually brings about change and having you know, the feeling that you're empowered to do that. So a really important document was, was uh, this in 2015. So next slide, please. Okay, so I'll just sort of go through the four areas because it's important that we know what these all mean. And I'm conscious of, of time, so I, I'm, excuse me if I'm sort of rattling through it a little bit. Um, space, um, as I explained to our children, it's uh, it's about children having a space in which which they can start to talk. So it might be a physical space, like a room designated to, to talk, a, a slot on a very busy timetable, uh, a, 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 a more importantly, a, a space that it feels safe. So this Lundy model is used in, in social care. Uh, Manchester and Leicester uh, have been particularly dominant in, in using this. Uh, so a child who might be in care or subject to, to domestic violence, they need to feel safe before they can start opening up. Uh, voice. 
well, a voice can be in, in many different ways. It can be a one-to-one, -one, it can be uh, in a group, it can be uh, online, it can be written down, but it's about giving people the opportunity to express their views in whatever way. And again, that feeling of, of, of safety. A lot of our children think of it when we're having discussions in our schools, think about how a shy child or a marginalised sh child, a child who doesn't usually raise their hand much, um, how that child uh, can, their views can, can be, uh, um, be heard and how we can give them confidence. So Lundy says over the years, uh, schools have done the first two really well, space and voice. So when we are inspected, we have Ofsted inspections in school in, our, in, in the UK, which are government based. Uh, many schools have ticked the box to say, yeah, we have a school council. Yes, we listen to pupils views. But what they're crucially missing most of the time is the next two, the last two sections, what we call them domains, and that's audience and influence. So the audience, and this is crucial, it's targeting, it's having someone who will listen to you, that who can bring about change. Uh, so that's crucial. So it could be the head teacher. It could be if it's something to do with the, the school kitchens. It could be the, the school cook. You know, it could be a whole host of diff different people. And the influence is about the children and the young people being able to see that their views have been listened to and then it's been acted upon, that change has been brought about. OK, and as I've, 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 I've not read out the notes here, but you, you can see from the influence, it's realistic, it's transparent. Feedback and follow up are crucial. Communications with agency are the fundamental basis of how it how it works or it doesn't work. It's that which is important. If you can go forward, then, please, uh, Tony. Right. So uh, at our Thrive Cooperative at school, um, we are developing a strategy of using voice and influence. Um, and uh, we actually changed our, our name from a previous incantation to, to, um, to, to become Thrive. Um, so um, back at the start of last year, we uh, started working with our local university, the University of Hull, uh, some really eminent academics there who suggested and pointed us in the direction of Lundy. And from there, we were just sold on it and we, we've developed it since then. So next slide, please. Um, so what do we do in practical terms? First of all, we give out a, a pupil survey. This pupil survey used to be based on questions that the government used in its soft inspections, but we felt that really wasn't helping us as, as much as we want to. We wanted to do something else as well. So we did a quantitative uh, survey. So the survey goes out, it's divided into the four sections of the Lundy model, space, voice, audience, and influence. And we collect data from that. So we've got graphs and all that sort of, of stuff. And that's all collated. It's collated by school and it's collated across our trust. Our trust, uh, which is in, in Hull in East Yorkshire, has seven primary schools and two secondary schools. And um, we're having another uh, secondary school join us in September. So that's roughly 5,000 students and, uh, and, and about 1,000 members of staff across uh, those 10 uh, places. So it's sort of a middle, middle sized uh, trust. Um, so we do this quantitative survey, which uh, gives us graphs. Uh, and that sort of gives us a starting point. So which of those areas appear to be, be lower? And then we move on to the next section when we've done that. So that takes sort of a, a place. If you can go on to the next section, uh, please. So these are these are so, sort of a list of questions that we have. Um, again, you perhaps difficulty seeing some of those, and we'll go through those quickly. But again, if you have chance, go back and look at them. Get sort of get a feel to, to, to what we, we're asking in these in these areas. Right. If you can go through to the next one, please. Okay. So from from that point, uh, we feed all the data into these things called dashboard slides. They're, they're PowerPoint uh, presentations. And why we put them into PowerPoint presentations is that, that that can be shared with different groups of people. The first group of people the data is shared with are, are the school councils in each of the school. Whether when, when Ireland had their national participation uh, just 
stop, okay, just stop for that. Uh, when the uh, Irish government had their uh, framework, uh, lots of schools were saying, uh, we want our school councillors to be, be stronger, to, to be more, uh, uh, to, to, to give our, uh, our views over in a more positive way. We want that strengthening. So that's why our student councils see the data first. And they have this first shot at trying to explain what, why they think some of the data comes out as it, as it does. You know, why could they, uh, it, um, how could they strengthen an audience? And at the moment, I'm just going through that process. We do it in the spring term, our surveys. So this is the second year we're doing it. So we're able to compare last year's uh, baseline with this year's. And we're seeing like, why was it low this year? How has it, how has it gone up? Uh, and having those meaningful conversations with groups of children, that's the important thing, starting this process. When the, when the children have done these dashboards, we, we then go into assembly with the same uh, PowerPoint presentation we show to the whole school. And then we start to, and, and then the, the pupils uh, who have seen this in the school council explain what, what they've discussed. And then it gives us further um, opportunity for the rest of the school to come back to them that during the week or wherever, you know, whenever they have, have uh, that capacity to say, actually, we'd like to add this and that. So then the dashboard is completed. And the last bit of this dashboard are four suggestions, one for voice space, one for voice, one for audience and one for influence. And they go to the school leadership team who take these on board and then put these into what we call the school development journey, which is our equivalent of perhaps your school improvement plan or school development plan. We like to think we're on a journey, hence school development journey. And so then the cycle will continue like that, having discussions, having feedback, listening to what children said. And so it's we're, we're on a cycle just as we're using this sort of cyclical model of the Lundy model. Right, so if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, so I'll just go through the, the so, so this here just is a snapshot, just a, a, a cut and paste, uh, pasted from one of our school development journeys. So it's one of many objectives uh, which are, are part of this uh, journey, but there is uh, purposefully one which says pupil voice. There's also one, Ashad, which says staff voice, and there's a further one which says uh, parent voice. So we take these three really seriously. Okay, so if you could go to the next one, please. Uh, uh, how are we doing for time? Yeah. Okay, uh, so a few things we, we do along the way. Um, there's a lot of uh, people now who are starting to write policies which are written by the children. So the British Academy in London has been in the last few years writing policies and on the steering committees they have pupils, uh, young people and they have adults. In Hull we have a young mayor because we have a Lord, we have a, a Lord Mayor of Hull and we have a young mayor and that young mayor and some of her uh, uh, colleagues, her, her friends, have written in the last year an anti-racism policy, which has been sent to all the schools, about 70 odd schools in the, in the city. So it's directly come from the students, a real sort of strong sort of idea uh, of the children having a voice. And here's the impact. We've written an anti-racism policy, which we want you to, to impact. Okay, so obviously there's more about the influence, about how effective this will be. Okay, so if you can go on, please. Um, so communication, as I said, it's really important to show children and keep reminding them how this works, that, you know, this is about developing their agency. So the schools at the moment are putting together case studies. The case studies, again, in slide presentation, so they can share it with school, with the rest of the school, with the governing body, with our trust board, with all sorts of different people. Uh, and it's split into four different areas. And it can range from a whole host of things. One, one school, I've taken the, the, the snapshots and show you on, posted on this screen, was about bringing the tuck trolley back uh, in their school. The tuck trolley is something that, that where, where you can buy apples and oranges and drinks and stuff at playtime. It had uh, been kicked into touch. It had been stopped because of the COVID pandemic. So this school wanted to bring it back. So we went through this journey of how they brought it to the school council and the space and listening to how they heard the voice of the children. Then they took it to the head teacher who was the audience 
and then they could see how the changes were brought about. So the truck trolley's back, and they've listened to other things such as uh, replenishing it in, in time. Uh, as we're coming, hopefully, into the, the warm, hot weather, they would like ice creams and ice pops and lollipops and things like that uh, during the, the summer. So that's just one aspect, but and it's that might seem a bit frivolous, a tuk trolley, it, but it's important to children. But we've done some other significant work which shows the uh, uh, importance of uh, agency. One of our uh, a couple of years ago, we did a lot of work on uh, the sexual harassment and sexual violence in schools agenda, uh, which was big nationally in this this country. And we found at one of the schools where we, we were getting this agency going, lots of the girls uh, who had felt perhaps victims before or who had lots of uh, sort of um, sexist or misogynistic uh, language used against them, so suddenly starting to find that they, they know that they have a voice, that they know which members of staff that they can go to if they, they, they experience this, and that they actually can see that something's been done as a result of that. So some quite serious things which are taking place as a, a, against this agency. And again, it's, you know, we can quote some case studies. One girl in particular, our safeguarding uh, lead for our first quotes is saying, very shy uh, girl, but now if you talk to her, she feels empowered. If she has a problem with whether it's like a sexist type uh, thing or whether it's something else, she feels confident about who she knows she can go to to bring about change. And the school as a whole, there were some things which were raised which could be done on a sort of practical level, material level, such as some of this, uh, the, the stairwells in this school, uh, students said that they, they didn't feel they were particularly safe. Um, so CCTV cameras have been installed on all the stairwells now um, and they're monitored. I mean, I ha hasten to add, it's not a particularly violent school or anything like that, but that just that sense that everywhere is sort of being monitored um, and that no one's going to be messing around or playing pranks or pushing people down the stairs reinforced that idea that their views were listened to. The school hadn't sort of picked up on this uh, and they could do something about it. So it's quite, it's quite sort of powerful stuff, is this. If you could go through to the next slide, please. Uh, OK, so where we are to, to, to sort of finish off and I'm, I'm go, apologies for going slightly over, guys. Uh, before uh, April, we had the first national UK network uh, conference of the Lundy model. So this is a picture of me standing next to, to Laura. Um, so what we intend to do now is to have a steering group to write a national participation strategy using the Lundy model for this country. And similarly, uh, regional strategies are being written with, with, on a moment, moment for uh, Yorkshire and North Humberside, and there's one also for, for Hall as well. So things are, are, are developing now to, to, to um, further push out the, the idea of the Lundy model. As I said, no one's in it for any financial gain or profit, anything like that. It's solely about empowering children and giving them this. And surely, you know, the, the question is opposed to you. If this isn't about helping to develop uh, resilience, then I'm not sure what else can be. As they so, and again, that question at the start about can schools be resilient, uh, whether they're in, engaged in the global uh, dimension. Well, we I have been uh, engaged in the global the dimension, but a lot can be done for building resilience in your own school, in your own trust, in your own city. Okay. So it, it's not about, about completely about that. Um, I've whisked through that, absolutely whisked through. But if you want to contact me, I'm on LinkedIn or you can do it, I'm sure, by, by Tony. Just give me a buzz. I'm more than happy to, to discuss a few things with you if you, if you wish. OK. <laughs> Great, Paul. Thank you very much. Really important about the the right for young people to express their views and feel safe and pupil agency. So brilliant work. And thank you for everything you do uh, in Hull and beyond. And just to say all the presentations will be available if you want to get in touch with Paul for follow up discussions. So okay, thank, thank you. you. And we're moving now to the wonderful David Geldart. Over to you, David. Good to have you with us. 
thanks for, thanks very much john uh afternoon everyone or morning or good evening where wherever you are i feel i must lower your expectations after john's um john's introduction um 17 years ago I, I found myself in in south africa doing some work i was invited to do some work with with their government their sport education based work operating operating in the 11 most deprived areas of south africa of which of which soweto wasn't one so i'm thinking this this must be a pretty a pretty tough gig um but it was wonderful and the, the one of the things that i asked for when i was there was to actually visit one of these areas and just to see if um, there was a possibility of maybe making a link between one of the schools in, in one of those deprived areas and, and my own school. The level of deprivation was quite stark. The, the area, rural South Africa, rural Kuzuno Natal, the highest rate of HIV AIDS um, in South Africa and indeed the world, 90% unemployment. And youngsters routinely walk two hours into school and walk two hours home. Just, just, just amazing. I sat down in the in the roundhouse with a local chief and the head teacher of a local school, Mount Kanya School, and I just listened. I, I went with no agenda other than to learn and just to sense what were the two converging circles and somewhere in the middle could we possibly work together? And uh, what we came up with was the notion of of sport. Could we use sport as a way of promoting education of health global citizenship very importantly and and leadership that, that was 17 years ago in both those schools St Mary's school which is based in Leeds um, serves youngsters from northwest Leeds and northeast uh, Bradford so a very a very mixed community and Mancania school in Kuzu and Natal 17 years on that partnership is very much embedded in both schools and has led to a whole range of things, not least what we now call the Bambi Snally Partnership. Um, oh, and can, we've gone we on to involve... Your, we can move we, your slides, okay. Yeah, okay. So we, we, can go, we, we, we can go back a slide, actually. Can we go back? Yeah, that, that'll be... That'll, is, there, is there one in between? That's... No, let's go back to the first one. I'll, I'll, I'll move it on. Yeah. Um, so 17 years on, we've now engaged with over 30 schools, uh, four universities, two colleges, an orphanage. So we, we've, we've gone from strength to strength, which in itself is, has needed great resilience <laughs> from, uh, from all the team. And we, and we have got a wonderful team. It's certainly not, it's certainly not just down down to me. At the very start of this, we were absolutely committed to two-way learning. What this was never going to be, uh, I was determined that it was never going to be a European school going to Africa, telling African people what to do. It just strikes me as, as, as ridiculous, uh, but, it, but it does happen. So we're, we're absolutely committed to two-way learning. Youngsters from the UK, youngsters from South Africa, work, working together in, in a whole range of ways um, as I say, so they both learn and they work together. Working, um, working together and learning together is our strap line. Okay, that, that's, that's the background. Let's, let's move on a slide or two. Let's, let's go to resilience. Res, um, resilience is, 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 is complex and, it, and it's complex in, the, in, in a complex world. And there are different aspects of, of resilience, the physical and psychological, and emotional. But, but for me, this, this quote from Mandela, just just sums it up really. This is this is this is my my kind of perception of of what is meant by a by resilience, and uh, and a belief that schools can do more. Next slide, please. Life life certainly is tough for young people, and it's a different world, and it's certainly a different world. Uh, I'd say even 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 five years ago, ten years ago, and certainly when a hundred years ago when I was at school, the world has moved on absolutely massively um and for young people uh, you know it's difficult it's difficult you know this they're surrounded by a whole range of things you know not least social media and a whole range of things that i think perhaps can give them a false perception of of the world and in, and indeed themselves and and their place in it and i think certainly you know the the role of schools has to be uh, to navigate through this you know they every day they're seeing things on instagram of perfect people in a perfect world and 
you know the world the world's not like that uh, and I think to believe it is I think work works against resilience it, it, it moves us towards a dependence which is not not healthy so as educators I mean if if we do if we do believe that we've got a role to play in helping young people navigate a way through uh, through this uh, and for that navigation we certainly need a moral compass more and more I, I would I would suggest you know, maybe maybe we need to look at schools and and what they do. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, for me, resilience is about more than bouncing back. Resilience is so important. I mean, I I just do not believe that you can reach your full potential. And if you look at people in sport and in business, and you know, they, when you look at their histories, they they have failed and failed and failed and failed. And because of that failure have managed to gain enormous strength and experience and, and come good. You know, there's that, there's that wonderful quote from perhaps the greatest basketball player of all time, Mike, uh, Michael Johnson, who said that he'd, he'd missed, he'd missed 9,000 shots in, it, in his career. He'd lost 300 games, but it was because of those failures that he succeeded. And, and, I, and I think that's, that's, a great kind of, that's a great kind of thought to keep. Resilience for me is, is is inextricably linked to that self-perpetuating notions and interrelated qualities uh, and behaviors such as positivity, a growth mindset, persistence, determination, grit, proactivity, and, adapti and adaptability. What schools wouldn't want to develop those capacities in our, in our young people? Next slide, please. Okay, my experience uh, is, is, is very much that resilient people see setbacks in context. You know, it's the kind of Instagram world that we live in, you know, doesn't, doesn't allow for things not to be perfect, for failures to happen, for mistakes to happen. Um, I think resilient people put, are able to put those in, in, into context. And my experience also is that resilient people take on challenges, they can focus on what can be changed uh, instead of wasting time and energy on things that cannot take responsibility, solve problems, have effective coping strategies, have a wider worldview, set realistic but challenging goals, prepare to think differently. That's an interesting one, isn't it, for uh, schools. Um, challenge the norm. You look at successful people, they are prepared to challenge, they're prepared to do things differently. Happy to fail, happy to fail and learn from it. You know, I. I it's an, again, it's an interesting question for schools. And above all, I would say that resilient people, they have hope and they, they perhaps also have faith and they perhaps also have, have belief. So it gives a very different kind of person, doesn't it? And so why wouldn't schools want to contribute to developing resilient young, young people? Because as, as John said earlier, without question, one of the, one of the great benefits of resilience is, is empowerment. You, you're empowered to be you. You're empowered to take your place in, in, in the world. So what can schools do to promote the above? Well, I think if you, when you analyze schools, I mean, a lot of schools around the world tend to have very academic curriculums, which looks at one aspect of intelligence. Maybe that we should be looking at different types of, of intelligence. Teaching styles in many schools tend to be, tend to be teacher-led. And if you look at Moston, Moston and Ashworth's work, Moston and Ashworth's work on, teach, on, on, uh, on learning styles and teaching styles, you know, there are a whole range of ways from teacher-led through to more experiential learning that, uh, that can captivate our, our young people. So maybe schools need, need to look at not just what they do, but, but how, how they do it, making uh, educators aware of those possibilities. And for me, it comes back to, is, is there a possible mismatch between what we say we want to do with school? Maybe, maybe even a mismatch between our, our mission statement and, our, um, and, what, and what actually takes place in the classroom. So what can schools do? If we, if we, if we think all those things are good things, why don't, schools, why don't schools do more of it? Okay, next, next slide, please. Uh, this is this is just what this is just what one of the one of the things that that we've done really and it's through through our international work i do think that sport and leadership on volunteering and international encounters can bring something very very special indeed to developing 
uh, resilient young people. You just look at the nature of sport, the discipline required, the training required, the kind of the kind of sports psychology things that that you pick up on, like like goal setting and stress management. Just, it, it's just full of, of great things that can help resilience. Leadership, volunteering, international encounters. So the Bambistani Partnership, our link with South Africa, aim to encapsulate all those things. A big challenge, and um, uh, it's not always easy. On, on, on the caption there, you, you can see um, some of the youngsters from, from Leeds in South Africa. We, we do a whole range of projects. Um, there are teacher exchanges between both countries. We have students um, that travel to South Africa. That's back on now, of course, af, af, after COVID. And over the last 17 years, we've engaged with 11,000 11, youngsters, children from both countries, have engaged in our in our programs and and projects. What you see on the screen is um, a really interesting leadership program that we do that brings young people from South Africa and the UK together, and they jointly do a leadership program. And then at the end of the leadership program, they are charged with preparing, organising, leading, and then evaluating uh, a sports festival for over a hundred young primary school children in sports, of course. And then they also do a literacy festival, a reading festival, and the books we use are, are sports-based. Um, in South Africa, ultimately, all the exams are taken in English. Uh, the youngsters that we work with are all, are all Zulu speakers. Um, so ultimately, the, the youngsters do, do need to learn English. So we've, we've used sport and literacy. Uh, we've combined those, those two things. So there's there's our young people working together on one of our pro, on one of our programs. Uh, next slide, please. This is the environment that we that that we work in. Um, it's really interesting. What, one of my friends, a journalist, and she points and she saw the picture of the young girl in pink at, at the top there, and we were talking about resilience. The, the young the young girl there is a, an AIDS orphan, and she's that she can see it's a barbed wire fence. And she said, how, if it was one of the youngsters from the UK, from Leeds, how long would it take them for them to have cut their hands on that, on that fence? And that young girl in South Africa has clearly worked out a whole range of things. And you might just ask, you know, are our, have, we come, have, have we become too risk averse in our, in our, in our schools? As parents, are we, are we too risk averse? And is that taking away, does that take away from from developing resilient young people? It's just, it's just, just a question. Next slide, please. Okay, here are, here are young people that are just, they're just about to start the festival. They've worked together for a, for a week. And one of the things that we obviously is developing a festival like that, they've got to plan it, they've got to organize it. And obviously we, we do lots of training with them. And being, being prepared for the unexpected is, is part of that training. And on this particular occasion, uh, they were expecting 100, 100 young primary school children and 180 turned up. So that problem solving, so it wasn't the end of the, when that happened, it wasn't the end of the world. They just got together, they worked together, they worked out a solution and solved it and delivered the most magnificent. And the teachers, we we just stood back and just we just let them do it. And it's it's a scary thing, but it's, it's a scary thing for a teacher to, to, to do that. But they solved it and produced the most wonderful festival. So these are young people, you know, they'd only met uh, a week prior to this, but already they've established that notion of, of team. And um, yeah, so there we are, just resilience in, in action. Next slide, please. And again, I've already, I've already mentioned the special what I think, you know, the special power of sport and uh, Mandela mentioned it many, many times in, in his career. So again, just that notion of, of, of using sport as part of our delivery um, as it has, has been a no brainer. It, it just simply works. I'll come back to that quote because we used it. We used it as a, as a project uh, for youngsters in both countries. So just, just bear in mind that wonderful quote. Next, next slide, please. Okay, I would not want you to leave this conference thinking that it's all down to me. It certainly isn't down to it certainly isn't down to me. We've got a wonderful team, and some of the team you, you can see there, they they 
they are they're absolutely magnificent from both countries and we we would not have got 17 years on and grown and become more successful without being resilient and we you know one of the reasons that we are resilient is that we've got resilient people uh, or we develop resilient people or we or we attract them but it, that creates a resilient team um, and I would say the same for school for school teams as well you know developing your staff spending time developing your staff so they understand resilience and the importance of that next slide please okay this this this, I think, is just a wonderful metaphor for uh, uh, resilience and perseverance and all that and all those things. We do a cycling program. In fact, we've just we've just um, we've just about to embark on a project that will train five thousand young people a year how to ride bikes and maintain bikes in KwaZulu and Natal. This is this is our, this is our first um, cycling project, and you can see on the on the on the sluice, on the on the two slides towards the right hand side. You know the youngster is is just about is just about to take those those first steps as it were in terms of being independent and moving that bike on under their own steam and then success you know for the for the person that's helped teach them and for the youngster on the bike but cycling is a great metaphor for resilience isn't it you you have to fall off you you have to fall off you're not gonna you're not gonna learn it without falling off Again, I'll go back to day to day in school. You know, do we do we allow kids to fail? Is it is it is it okay to make mistakes? Well, it well it is because that's the only. And yet, I think far too often, uh, youngsters uh, they become accustomed or almost uh, you know almost frightened to make mistakes. And I think we must move away from that and think differently. Next slide, please. Um, think back to the Mandela quote. Um, I, I'd love to engage other areas of, of the curriculum in, in both schools. We, we use that quote to, to use the, um, to utilize creative writing. So with the English departments and art departments. And we said to youngsters in, in both schools, what does that Mandela quote mean to you about, about sport? Can you produce a piece of artwork or a piece of written work uh, that just says that, you know, that, that just captivates that for you? And we, we discussed between the two schools what success might look like. And we thought, well, if we get 30 youngsters from both schools having a go at this, then great. No, we, we didn't get 30 from each school. Uh, we got 650 youngsters that just did and produced work. Just amazing work. Uh, the piece of artwork in the middle was produced by the most introverted girl at my school. And she left the piece of work wrapped up outside the head of arts office and that was her offering that piece of art now hangs in the south african high commission in 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 london uh, it's just an amazing project the, the written work was equally you know was 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 equally good we have a bambisani enterprises group it's a student-led group that raises funds for the charity uh, they sold pieces of artwork and they sold pieces of artwork uh, all over the world, this old piece of artwork in Paris and, and New York, and some of the pieces there are pieces that sold. Next, next slide, please. Okay, we, we, there are lots of stats about what you know. Lots of people like stats, um, and I've mentioned a few of them all already. Eleven thousand youngsters have taken part in our program so far. That's going to massively increase in the next two years. That will move to something like seventeen thousand in a year's time. And in two years' time, we'll have engaged more than 25,000 youngsters in a variety of projects. Some are visit dependent, a lot just run all the year round, but they engage young people and they're based on working together and, and learning together. Next slide, please. I like the stats, but I like, I like the quotes from young people more because behind all those stats, there, there are real people, there are real children, and they tell, they, they're honest, they'll, they'll tell you how it is. And we've religiously kept these stats over, uh, uh, sorry, kept these um, quotations, these children perspectives uh, over the years. Now, I think this speaks very much to what John, John was talking about, about voice and a lots of things that have been said uh, have, shaped our, have shaped our work going forward. In fact, um, yeah, if I get a chance, remind me, remind me, John, to mention the story about Brogan, if, if, if there's time. Um, okay, next slide, please. 
I think I think the top one for me just blew me away as a, as an educator. This, this this was the first group that I ever took to South Africa, and that was a, a young lady. Yeah, I was. Yeah, I was I was blown away. And again, the 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 bottom quote, you know, you, I think I honestly believe that resilience can be. You can be inspired to be resilient. You can see things. You can see things in people. You know, so from from my school, those of you that like your music, you know, the, the Kaiser Chiefs were the band that went to my school. When I invited them back into school, they they talked about 10, 10 years of on the road being not very successful. Then again, this is the same kind of thing. You know, learning learning from people that have to walk two hours into school each day and want to go to school and want to learn is absolutely inspirational. I think you can be inspired. I think you can be inspired to be resilient. And it's great when you see it from people that, it's that relationship thing between, you know, people like you, people of your age or people that have been to your school. Hearing, hearing, that, hearing that failure is okay and we keep on going, uh, it's, just, it's just wonderful. Schools don't do enough of it. Oh, I, oh I, I slipped in my point of view there, apologies. Next slide, please. <laughs> Okay, so these, these are from the African students. Okay. Powerful stuff, isn't it? I, 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 it nev they, never fail to, they never fail to get to me, these quotes. Next slide, please. One of the things we do, I've already mentioned, is our leadership course. And there was a young, uh, there was a youngster. I'm sorry. And when we give the certificates out at the end of the leadership course, so again, we, you know, we, we, we let people know what's important. You know, we we appreciate this leadership, so we value it. So we've got awards in it. And again, it, it just it just sends a message. You know, this is this is another, this is another type of skill. It, it's another it's another type of intelligence, and we value it, and we'll recognise it, and we'll reward it schools can do the same so when we hand out when we hand out these certificates i always say to the youngsters or whoever's leading it says okay this is a starting point this is not an end point you know this is what are you going to do with it um one youngster famously said to me um i want to be a teacher so these class sizes of 60 lives on his own lives uh, is there are no parents around no no Laptops, no computers. I want to be a teacher. I want to. So he's got to get the equivalent of A levels. Anyway, next slide, please. So this this is Sim Pui, who wanted to be a teacher. So he's completed his leadership course. He's got he's got a mountain to climb in terms of the in terms of passing these exams. Everything is against him. Everything's against him um the class sizes re resources next slide please here he is he did it absolutely amazing so simpui was our was our first bambi Sinani, uh, teacher uh, amazing character his laser focus on the next barrier is just brilliant and i, I learned i've learned an awful lot from simpui i tend to look at the big picture simpui no the next obstacle, you know, I'll pass these exams, then I'll find the funding, then I'll start, I'll pass year one. Just brilliant, brilliant, you know, resilience, resilience in, in action, resilient in practice. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> okay. Well, this is one of our, one of our many supporters, um, ambassadors, really. Um, and I think there's an awful lot of resilience comes from the nature of our partnership. You know, we, we, whilst economically we might be different, you know, it's an equal partnership, <clears throat> excuse me, in, in so many ways. Uh, and I think that we've, we've built on sound foundation really, really helps us uh, as an organization to be, to be resilient. And I'm, and I'm not suggesting that this work is easy. It's, it's not easy, um, but it's worthwhile. Next slide, please. <clears throat> William is one of our wonderful, um, uh, one of our wonderful head teachers. And I, I sometimes just have a look at this quote because it, it, it sends shivers down my spine still. Um, and that just continues, continues to motivate. That concept of Ubuntu is just wonderful. 
And again, it's something that schools have to consider as part of their mission, you know, that and, and, and helping young people see the world differently, take those, take those blinkers off, see the world differently and see their place in, in the world. Next, next slide, please. Ah, that's it. I, I've probably gone way over time, but and if I have, I apologise. But uh, thank you for listening. That's great. Thank you, David. And I love that quote. It's my duty to be a global citizen. I think all of us would agree with that. Brilliant work and long may it continue. OK, moving across now from uh, Yorkshire and South Africa across to wonderful Lebanon. And we're very proud to be joined by uh, the fantastic Rolla Kadaj. Over to you, Rolla. Hello, everyone. Uh, I think Paul and David put my, my PowerPoint to shame. <laughs> <laughs> I should have asked to go first. <laughs> uh, but um, we're still at the beginning stages of what we, uh, what we are doing. And uh, due to a lot of issues that we've been facing in Lebanon, uh, we, um, we haven't been able to do much, but living in the country that actually needs the support has given us a, a vision and a, and, a, and a real deep feeling that we need to do something. So I can see Dave, David's face when he was talking with the enthusiasm and the, the feelings and the heart. And I can understand uh, where he's coming from. But before I start, I want to see how you are doing, those who are with us. So, uh, Tony, can we have the next slide, please? Okay, what I want to do with you, because, um, because we never stop and, and check our emotions and feelings, and I will tell you why I want to always check on my emotions and on my feelings. I want to take this moment to explain to you how we can check on our feelings. And I would like you to join in the conversation in the chat. So uh, I would like, what you see in front of you here is what we call the mood meter. It's a scientific tool that helps unpack our emotion, uh, emotional lives. Uh, as you can see on the X axis, we have the pleasantness. So, um, what are you thinking right now? How, how pleasant is it? Is it in the minus five or the towards the plus five? And then we have the energy, which is on the Y axis. Is it high energy or low energy? So how are you feeling? In which color are you in? Are you in the blue, the red, the yellow, the green? And then after you tell me which color are you in, so are you high pleasant, high, uh, high energy? Are you low energy, high pleasant? Because we can also have that. So are you? tell me in which color are you in? The green, the red, the yellow, the blue. Okay, I would really like to see more answers in the yellow. Wow, nice, amazing. Green, okay. <laughs> all right, my, my next question to all of you, my next question to all of you, if I ask you to describe your emotion or tell me how you're feeling right now, which emotional word or which word would you use? Content, okay. Anything else? At the end of the long school year, <laughs> we're in the green. Can you engage? Excellent. Okay, so how are we feeling? Give me a, a, a word. Let me give you a little cheat sheet here. Can I have the next slide, please? Okay, so in the next slide, you can see I'm giving you 100 words to actually identify your feelings. Where in the English language, we have probably over 2000 words where we identify our feelings with. The thing is, we don't know how to do it. And if we don't know how to do it, we're never going to be able to be self-aware and have self-awareness. And this is something that we need to promote in our children because well-being plays a huge role in uh, resilience. And if I don't have 
the capacity to actually identify my emotion and be aware of myself so I can manage myself and be able to work with others, then I won't, it would give me, it would be difficult to be resilient. Next slide, please. <laughs> In this next slide, I have my favorite quote. And the quote is, and once the storm is over, you won't remember how you made it through, how you managed to survive. You won't even be sure whether the storm is really over. But one thing is for certain, when you come out of the storm, you won't be the same person who walked in. And I think this is wraps up of what really resilience is, and is, is even if I'm in the storm, I'm going to come out and I'm going to be a different person and probably a better person. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm going to introduce our Shining Within uh, movement. And uh, I'm the founder of Shining Within. Now, Shining Within is going through some changes at this point. And we are, like we said, like I said, we are a baby project. Our vision that every person has the power to shine and our mission is actually, is to support every person to find their inner light and let it shine. Why did Shining Within Movement start? It's, uh, first of all, we're a group of educators. That's how we started. And recently we have been joined by two psychologists and our purpose, why did we start? It was towards the middle of the pandemic. We, we were facing a lot of issues in Lebanon. We, we had demotivation of students. We had a lot of uh, uh, burnout from teachers. And I think you can all relate to this. But one very huge event that happened in Lebanon was what we call the August 4th explosion. And it was identified as the second biggest explosion in the world. And we had a lot of issues. We had a lot of people trying to deal with this. We, have, we had over 3,000 people displaced from their homes. We had, we had around 200 people who, who passed away. So it was really difficult for us to deal with. And in addition to that, we had a huge economical crisis in the country. So our work had so much more meaning to to um, uh, to what um, to what we what the what the need is. I um, so what we started doing was actually at first supporting teachers, supporting schools, and by doing free webinars online because at that time we weren't able to have face to face uh, work. And we try to influence as many teachers as possible to just give them that push to move forward. And then uh, we thought that we need to do more. And that's when we, start, when we had the psychologists join us. And right now we're working on trying to develop material to support per parents in the common issues that they face with bringing up their children. And at the same time, explaining how we can support, how they can support to develop resilient, uh, resilient children. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, so if, if we wanna, if we wanna talk about, um, if we wanna, um, apologies, um, something happened to my screen. Just give me a second. Okay, so if, if we wanna give, a meaning of what resilience is. And according to the American Psychologist Association, resil resilience is the process and outcome of successfully adapting to difficult or challenging life experiences, especially through mental and emotional and behavioral flexibility and adjustment to external and internal demands. And this was mentioned from uh, uh, Paul and from David during their sessions. We need to have emotional, mental, behavioral flexibility and adjustment, and we need to, to, to have that well-being within us to be able to move forward. Next slide, please. Now, one thing that we misunderstand, and it, it takes us a while to really comprehend what resilience is. Resilience is really about how we recharge, not how we endure. 
okay? Overwork and exhaustion is the opposite of resilience because if we're overworked and exhausted, exhausted we cannot be resilient. Next slide, please. So it's very clear that well-being leads to resilience and a lot of studies have showed that because we have to be able to be resilient, we have to be self-aware, okay? We have to have self-awareness. We have to have positive relationships. We have to have mindfulness, okay? Gratitude is very important. And journaling how we feel, how will help us and, and setting our goals, writing our goals so we can be resilient enough to reach these goals. Journaling plays a huge role there. And then reflecting, and then we should have a sense of purpose. Next slide, please. Okay, now, as you saw in, in the previous uh, slide, uh, sorry, in the previous presentations, how resilience is built in school. It's very, it's really, many of us are already doing it, but we need to highlight it more. So we have to provide a safe and supporting learning environment, provide students with the opportunity to, uh, for goal setting. And these were the things that we did webinars on with schools and teachers. Okay, develop your students' sense of belonging uh, to the school. Of course, we even we, we, we talked about celebrating small progress, progress, not the huge successes only, because these small steps and um, a progress would give the, the student the, and the feeling that they are moving forward and they're succeeding. And develop student agency, of course, and uh, David talked a lot about that. Uh, challenge your students, provide effective feedback, develop their growth mindset. And this is very important because when someone lives in a fixed mindset, they are unaware of the capacity and where they can move. They just lock themselves that I don't know how to do it. And of course, uh, we have developed problem solving skills. Next slides, please. Okay, this is my favorite story that I always love to tell whenever I am asked to talk about what we do. And I'm going to read it to you. This is an essay. Was, it was written by a young uh, man. His uh, his, uh, he's around 15, 16 in one of the schools in Lebanon. And it, it was so touching. And then I'll tell you why I'm sharing this story. So he said, have you ever been in a mental decline? Have you ever felt that everything is closed in front of you? Have you ever seen your dad depressed and worried, thinking of how to offer nutrition to his family? Have you ever wanted to join your favorite program meeting, but you had no electricity? Well, I did. I am living in a country of sorrow, or should I say I am living in hell? Yeah. I am living in a place where the ghosts of grief are everywhere. For the first time, I feel that I don't want Lebanon. I want to leave. I want to leave. I want to go and search for my happiness, my well being, the place that satisfies me. I don't want to live in a place where schools are closed. I don't want to be in a place where I should think, am I going to die of hunger one day? I don't want a place that doesn't appreciate me. I don't want a place where justice is eliminated, where bad people are appreciated and poor people are humiliated. Nowadays, we're just looking for our simple demands. I want something, I wanted something that removes depression of me that tells me how great and good I can be. So when the teacher read this essay, she was shocked because we know that our students in the country were going through a lot of uh, problems. And she happens to be one of the educators who's working with Shining Within. And that's when we really got going to start developing webinars for teachers and work with them. Next slide, please. And that's when she started to work with her students. So she first 
worked on regular activities to improve the student's well-being, such as mindful breathing on a regular basis, self-awareness exercises, such as identifying our emotions, and similar to what we did at the beginning, she, she made sure that they had a space they can express themselves and talk to her and talk to their friends. They started supporting each other, peer support one-on-one -on -one or in a, uh, not on one-on-one, -on -one, sorry. It was a, a, through a blog where each one of them, whenever was feeling down, would actually mention it and someone else would come in and say, well, this is what I'm doing right now. Why don't you try doing that? And that makes me feel uh, better. They even put, posted what are the activities that actually relax them the most and so on and so forth. Can we move to the next slide, please? Okay, and now this is where it really came, where resilience has uh, begun to, to uh, come out. So then she started involving her students with international activities to give them, of course, a sense of purpose and to provide them with the space for student agency. While working on their project, even the smallest progress, as we mentioned, were celebrated. Students were able to set goals of achievement, develop their problem-solving skills. And what happened to that young man that wrote the essay? Next slide, please. This is it. So he became a global president, and he was the winner of topical talk award of 2022 and all and both of these and these are only some of the achievements that he uh, he reached right now he has finished school he is in university and up to this day still works and coordinates international activities with different people so i think this is even if it's just one example it really gives us how important it is to really think about the well-being of our students so we can reach and get uh, a really good level of resilience. Next slide, please. And that's it. I want to say thank you. My presentation was concise and short, not that short, but it was okay. Uh, thank you so much. And if anyone has any questions, I don't know. Back to you, John. <laughs> well, uh, that was fantastic. You know, you. We, I think we're all so proud to, to be part of your own learning journey. And I know how much Shining Within means to you and all your colleagues across Lebanon. It really is fabulous work. And we've had three fabulous presentations. I mean, where, where does one begin all about the importance of resilience, the importance of supporting each other through these challenging times? Um, lots of amazing comments in the chat to say thank you. Has anyone got any questions? to our wonderful speakers. Please put them in the chat or do unmute and come online and ask. Okay, there was a question I think to you, Paul, uh, earlier about, um, is, do you feel it's only in school that young people can have that safe space for agency? Uh, no, not at all. Yeah, I saw that as well. We're developing agency across uh, other uh, areas. So again, I mentioned about social care, uh, but one of the, the people I work with, uh, she's in charge of a project project called Generation Hall, which is developing arts across the uh, the city. She has a steering group of, of young people who works outside, that they meet after school in one of the youth centres in Hull. And that's, you know, she's created that same sort of uh, idea model with the Lundy model. So it could be in a youth club, it could be in a, in a after school sports club or, uh, you know, a, a football team or hockey team or a music thing you know the, the, this sense of agency can work all in in lots of different scenarios that's why it's it's that basic structure it's nice and simple uh, and uh, you, you can use it for lots of different sort of areas so so don't just think it's limited to school or any other particular thing you know the world the world's the oyster with it really it is. It's a really fantastic model. Um, as we said, the comments are all coming through thick and fast to say thank you to you all. 
uh, how rich the presentations have been, how informative, how incredibly strong the presentations have been. So again, it's a, a huge thank you from us all and that amazing Global School Alliance family. We always say it, but we'll say it again, uh, globally minded educators are the most important people in the world. So it's a huge thanks from us all. It's it's our pleasure to work with amazing people. So just to say, uh, for those of you who haven't joined the Global School Alliance, please do so. Uh, we're delighted to, to have you join us. And do consider becoming ambassador. Uh, the amazing presentations you've heard have been from uh, three of our wonderful Global School Alliance ambassadors, and we're proud to work with you. And do join us on the 29th of June uh, for our next webinar. And do complete the um, evaluation, and we're delighted to send you a certificate as well. And I don't know if Brogan has joined us, David. Um, <laughs> um, um, amazing. You muted, David. You muted. Unmute. <laughs> amazing student that David used to teach who has gone on to amazing things, a bit like mm. the amazing Muhammad that Wally used to teach. Yeah, I don't. I don't think she could. I think she's actually lecturing. Now. But one of the, there was a young lady that was on one of the slides. Actually, she was in the middle of a kind of huddle of young people from the UK and South Africa sorting out um, some issues for their sports festival. And she was a young lady who would be the first to admit that she struggled with school in in so many wow. in so many ways. Uh, she was bright, enthusiastic, but just school just didn't work for her. And to be honest, it didn't quite work for me. What, when I was that age, um, so but she, so but she, intrude. um, I've brought back with me her bloody interview notes and not Patricia's. Oh, 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 oh I don't, I, I, sorry, I don't know what that is. <laughs> yeah, no, ahead, what that is. Phone number. So sorry. We'll, we'll oh. try, we'll try and yeah. find her and mute her. Sorry. Carry on, David. <laughs> okay. oh, All right. Okay. Um, so she, she, the sport was a thing that kind of, kept her on the straight and narrow to a certain extent while, while, while she was at school. But, so we, she's one of the young ladies that we took to South Africa and the whole thing about the leadership and taking those blinkers off and seeing the world with different eyes, just, it sounds, it sounds very, very, uh, very grand, but it, you know, people talk about things being life changing. And for many of our youngsters, you know, they do talk about it being life changing. And I don't accept that anymore now. I, I, I say to them, tell, tell me how, tell me how it's changed your life. This young lady who was on the verge of perhaps not continuing at school, stayed on at school, did exceptionally well, went on and did A-levels, went to university. She's now a lecturer. She's probably, she's probably lecturing as we speak now in, in sport. Uh, in sport development. While she was at university, she, she started her own Bambisnani type thing and took youngsters to, uh, sorry, fellow students to Kenya, I think it was. It's all come full circle. Uh, Brogan is now one of the trustees of our charity and is shaping where we go next strategically. So it's come absolutely full circle from a youngster that really struggled, was captivated by the whole notion of, of global education and sport and leadership uh, turned a, a, a life round dramatically. And as I say, now help shape where we go next. So it's just, it's just a lovely true story. Fantastic, David. Thank you for that. And I think a final question for Lola about how did you manage to get students on board uh, to uh, ensure that they felt they owned agency in the school? It's uh, it's really it's really up to how we get to yeah, how we what are the steps that we take and and to get students on board. If we provide them with the space, they know that we we are there to support. We are there to help. We are there to give them the space to express themselves and hear them out. I don't think there will be an issue for them to to join and come on board with us. Our systems, unfortunately, and I'm not generalizing and I apologize, uh, please don't misunderstand me, but our systems have become, and I, I, I'm beginning to feel that that's happening all over the world, so academic that we're forgetting that we're teaching human beings and we're working with human beings. So we really need to develop both sides. I'm not saying we should stop in the academic part, but we do need to look on the other side as well to see what's going on with, the, with those students. And when they know that 
you are working with them wholeheartedly, they're not going to say no to you. Brilliant. Thank you, Ella. And I think um, that reminds you, I think the quote that we've all heard of about the importance of Mr. Mandela, education is the most powerful weapon we all have to change the world and talk about the and, and showing that all young people feel valued and there is set those safe spaces and agency for them. So again, a huge thanks from us all to Paul, to David, to Lola. Uh, it's been really, really informative and let's all stay in touch. The recording will be available on the Global School Alliance uh, website. And without further ado, I think it's a goodbye from me <laughs> and Tony, a goodbye from you. Yes, yeah, thank you everybody. But like I say, thanks for joining. If you could complete the survey, that will also make sure we've got your contact for your certificate for attendance. Yeah, and do stay in touch. Have a wonderful afternoon, a wonderful evening. You are the most important people in the world and thank you from the Global School Alliance. Thanks everybody. Thank, uh, thank, thank you. you. Bye, bye bye everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. See ya. Thanks, David. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Vala. Good to see you, Khalil. <laughs> Thanks, Geraldine. <laughs>